This program has been made possible in part by the following sponsors. The Trial Lawyers Association of B.C. The Vancouver Courier Newspaper. My new book about addictions, All the Way Home, Building Recovery That Works. The movies, television, pop culture, all like to emphasize that this is a youth-oriented culture, but the truth is the mean age in the United States today is 37. I'm guessing it's even older in Canada, which means tremendous strains on our healthcare system in every possible way. More of us are living longer and getting sicker for longer periods of time. Way up there in the costs for our healthcare are pharmaceuticals, our prescription uh, medicines. So how can we bring those costs down? People are always working on that uh, effort. And now we have some people, among them our guests, saying, wait a minute, why don't we have PharmaCare right inside? Why don't we pay for PharmaCare, have it right inside our, our medical system? And mysteriously, although it doesn't seem like it at first blush, that might bring the costs down. Dr. Steve Morgan has been writing about this, among other things. He is a professor at the University of British Columbia in the School of Population and Public Health. Hi, Steve. Hello. Thanks so much for coming along. So I think it seems almost counterintuitive. If we, if we put all of those expenses into our health care system, how would it be cheaper? Yeah. Well, I mean, at first blush, everybody says, you know, how, how could it possibly be less expensive to actually pay for more medicines out of the public purse? Right. But the fact is, is that every developed country in the world with a universal health care system, which is virtually every developed country in the world, yeah. uh, they all include prescription drugs in their universal health care systems. The only country that doesn't is Canada. And they all pay a lot less for prescriptions than we do. So the proof is in the pudding in the sense that yes. every comparable country you can imagine actually has better coverage and lower costs than we do. So, so the, first, the first way that we can intuit that they, they pay less is because they're buying truckloads of things. They're buying in bulk. Absolutely. So the first thing you yeah. get when you buy on behalf of an entire population is purchasing power. Yes. So, you know, an analogy I often like to draw is our liquor distribution boards in Canada. <laughs> Uh, yes. I don't know about you, but I've traveled uh, around. I've been in Australia and elsewhere yes. at, at touring vineyards. And I re yeah. recall one time being with Canadians at yes. an Australian vineyard. Yeah. And, and we were with a, a, a group of actually policymakers from Canada. And the, the owner of the vineyard in Australia said, oh, you guys are from Canada. Are, you wouldn't happen to be from Ontario, would you? And it's because when Ontario, the, the, the people who buy yes. uh, wine on behalf of the province, yes. uh, tour around the world to, to purchase wine, yeah. uh, they roll out the red carpet and they drop the prices as low as they can go because Ontario is the biggest purchaser of liquor in the world. Wow. And, and that, gives you, that. that gives you an idea. They get the yeah. cheapest prices for, for wine, spirits, yeah. you name it. You, you just caused half the population to sell their houses and move. Yeah, well, yeah, well yeah. British Columbia is pretty yeah. close in yeah. terms of the BC uh, liquor distribution out here is also a big okay. purchaser. Yeah. But what you do is you get, the, you get the purchasing power of basically group buying. It's like Groupon for medicines. Yeah. So what happens is that countries around the world that buy on behalf of their populations, and again, this is most countries that we would compare to, they buy their medicines on behalf of millions of people at a time. And so manufacturers of medicines effectively sharpen their pencils. They want to do a deal with a country, a country that's going to say, you can have all of this market or you can have none of this market. What, which would you like? And, and we do do deals already. But one of the things that puzzles me about all this in terms of public policy are, is why are some of these deals in camera? Why are we not allowed to know what some of the deals yeah. are? These are, this is tax dollars. Shouldn't we be aware of how we're spending? Well, sometimes a little bit of secrecy is good for the taxpayer. So in, okay. in, in some cases, when yeah. you're negotiating a deal with a supplier that also has to sell the same goods to countries around the world, 
that supplier might not want to pass on the same savings that they're going to give to you to everybody else. So for instance, uh, I've heard manufacturers of medicines say it would be really difficult for them to lower the price of a drug in British Columbia yes. because then there's a market of 50 million people in Brazil who would also need to have the same price reduction. So what happens is that c countries around the world, private insurance companies in the United States, public drug plans in, yeah. in countries that we would compare ourselves to, they negotiate discounts for manufacturers of medicines and they negotiate it in a sense in confidence, confidential contracts that involve rebates that get paid back to the government or back to the insurer. Here's an anomaly that I don't, you can explain to me, I don't get it. I know from personal experience that people in Italy, because I go to Italy a lot, spend a fortune buying something as mundane as aspirin. Aspirin in Italy come in blister packs, it's like they're gold, and you spend, you know, whatever, five euros or something for a little package that looks like gum, you know, but it's aspirin. So. I have shipped friends of mine bottles of aspirin like this that I pay three twenty nine for from the drugstore. Yeah. Right. And they they say, well, this is all controlled by the mafia. I don't know if they're right or what is it. Well, I mean, there's peculiarities yeah. in every country. So yes. some countries have high prices for over the counter medicines like aspirin, for instance. Yeah. Uh, other countries might have high prices for generic medicines, or or some have high prices for for brand name medicines. It's notable that aside from the over the counter market, you know, the, yes. the, the aspirins and whatnot that you can buy here often for relatively low cost, particularly if you want to shop at a wholesaler like Costco or something yes, like that. Yeah. Um, aside from that, Canada actually does pay among the highest prices, and this cycles back to this story that on prescription medicines, we're not very coordinated in how we buy medicines. We have public plans like BC Pharmacare that yes. pay for a minority of, of costs, uh, actually for a very small minority of people. We have private insurers that are fragmented all over the place, different insurance companies for different employer groups. And then we have lots of people who don't have any insurance at all, who have no negotiating power. So yes. as a function, our prices for medicines in this country are higher than most countries in the, in the world. The United States is an exception. Uh, they pay higher prices than we do. Uh, their system is even worse in even terms worse, of yeah. coordination. Yeah. But countries like New Zealand and Australia, they pay dramatically low, lower prices than we do for prescriptions. Lower enough that Canada would save literally billions of dollars every year if we just paid the same prices as they do. Just let's give people the rough picture of how this really works at present before yep. we get into the world according to Steve Morgan, the, the, the one that you want to change. Uh, I know as a senior citizen that I pay a small fortune for all these many medications I'm supposed to be taking. Uh, and then uh, Pharmacare looks at my, at my tax statement and says, okay, we'll give you a break by about October. You know, we'll we'll cut those in half or whenever whenever it kicks in. Yeah. It often doesn't kick in until the fall. Meanwhile, I'm spending a small fortune. Of course, I don't have much money, but as it, these things apparently are saving my life, one doesn't complain too much. Yeah. So in in British Columbia, we have a system of public drug coverage, which is often referred to as catastrophic drug coverage. Yes. It's meant to be government as payer of last resort. In a, in a sense, it's government getting out of the business of ensuring access to medicines and just saying, we just want to make sure nobody goes bankrupt paying their drug bills. Yes. That's quite a different model than, again, virtually every comparable country in the world. And it's even a different model than, can, than British Columbia had to, what, what now what, 10 years ago in two months, I guess. Yes. Uh, prior to 2003, we had a seniors drug program that was relatively comprehensive, fairly low co-payments. And, and basically what we would call first dollar prescription coverage from the government. Yeah. We also, for people under the age of 65, had a system just like you're describing. If people did have very high costs under the age of 65, they, they maybe had $1,000 in drug bills in a year, well, the government would start kicking in and actually pay for anything above that level. Uh, over the process of, of uh, transition from, uh, in, at the time, NDP to, to liberal government, uh, we phased out that, that package of drug benefits and basically treated everybody in the province the way we used to treat just people who, who are under 65. And that is, as you described, government kicking in when your costs exceed relatively high thresholds. And for British Columbia, those thresholds are 3% of household income. If your income is above $50,000 as a household, that's a majority of Do households. Do we have a lot of people who basically won't take medicines because they can't afford them? 
Well, interestingly enough, yes. Yeah. So part of the problem with our system, in the system of being a payer of last resort, is that you're not actually a system that encourages use of medicines that we want people to use. Uh -huh. British Columbia has, in Canada, the highest rate of what we call cost-related non-adherence. It's a technical term that basically really? means I don't we buy. have the highest financial barriers to use of medicines in the country. Uh, over 12% of British Columbians report that they, they can't uh, fill prescriptions. I think it's actually over 16%, sorry. Uh, and that's a remarkably high number. It's twice the rate as, an, as is found in Ontario. And it's, you know, roughly speaking, eight times the rate as is found in the United Kingdom. You, you, one of your arguments is that if, if uh, medicines were uh, part of the whole system and were paid for, then we could buy in bulk and yep. it would be cheaper. But one of your other arguments is that doctors would prescribe more efficiently or more smartly. At the moment, doctors are addicted to I mean, the second you walk in, they're writing you a prescription. Yeah, you know? uh, many doctors forego the exam. They just say, oh, yeah, you need blah, blah. You know? uh, do you really think that that will change? It seems to me it's a, it's a kind of behavior habit almost. Yeah, it's a culture of medicine that's stated back to the 1950s, to be honest. The post-war therapeutic revolution with Absolutely. the advent of, of, of antibiotics. antibiotics. Of course. It was yeah. every physician yeah. visit, uh, patients expected that would, it would end with a prescription at, at that time. And, and the that, patient is, is disappointed. If you walk out, yeah. as my doctor often says to me, David, shut up, go home, lie down, drink tea, watch golf, sleep. Right? So you're disappointed. Oh, I didn't get something. Yeah. I think one of the things we know from the evidence is that there are two uh, mechanisms to, to affect that habit. Yes. Uh, one is to change the way you pay doctors for providing care. In Canada, we have what's called fee-for-service payment for physician, right. uh, most physician care. And fee-for-service means basically you pay the doctor whatever it might be, $28 for a routine uh, medical visit. Yep. And physicians have incentive to see as many patients as possible, and so they want those visits to be as short as possible. When you're on a fee-for-service, you want the patient out of your office because you're only going to get one fee per patient per visit. So you want to keep it short. You write the prescription. You say, come back later if you want to talk about the other ailment. If we switch the way we pay doctors to something yes. more like a salary or what's referred to as capitation funded, it gives physicians the opportunity to say, you know what, I'd rather spend 20 minutes with you now and not see you again for two months rather than five minutes now, five Absolutely. minutes next week. And we, we, we must be on a fee-for-service because they're telling me to. we ah. got, got to go to break. Okay. <laughs> we'll catch our breath here, folks. Uh, give you an opportunity to go to our website, uh, davidburner.com, and a chance for... Uh, the nice people who support us here to say hello uh, uh, for this program here on Shaw Community Television, Cable 4, back in just a minute. This program has been made possible in part by the following sponsors. The Trial Lawyers Association of B.C. Vancouver Courier Newspaper. My new book about addictions, All the Way Home, Building Recovery That Works. I guess one of the questions that has to be asked is no matter who appears to pay for pharmaceuticals, in the end it is the taxpayer after all in some fashion or other. Our guest is Dr. Steve Morgan from the University of British Columbia who uh, not only does research but writes often about the issues of uh, public policy regarding pharmaceuticals. So uh, what do you say to, to the critics who will read your thoughts and then say, yeah, but we, you know, as a taxpayer I'm paying for it anyway. Yeah, so I think the, what we say is that if we pay for it in a way that is smarter and, and, uh -huh. and for, our, for the health system, which we publicly fund anyhow, yes. you're going to save money in the long run. So if we pay for medicines better, we're going to, for instance, reduce the price of medicines that we pay, which saves everybody. We're also, if we can change the way that we have an, uh, incentives, or the, change the incentives that we give to physicians around prescribing, we can get them 
to think more carefully about which drugs they're prescribing when a patient needs a treatment. Um, one of the ways to do that is to remind the physician that the cost of the medicines that they are prescribing is actually coming out of a budget that pays their salaries. And you don't want to tie that too closely to any one doctor, but as a profession, the more that physicians are aware that there's no such thing as a free lunch, right. the more cost conscious they will be when prescribing. And there's great evidence from countries around the world and from very many uh, health insurance systems in the United States that, that doing this actually does create more cost conscious prescribing. Is there first rate evidence uh, or research to demonstrate the hook between good pharmaceutical care and the then on necessity of, of, of going to the OR. For example, if I take a statin drug and that very effectively lowers uh, the bad cholesterol, raises the good cholesterol, so my numbers are better, blah, 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 that reduces my risk of going back for another angioplasty, which is worth, what, 20, 30 grand per episode? You know? Have we demonstrated that scientifically, Steve? Yeah, there is actually really good evidence yeah. on some therapeutic categories yes. that if you get patients to take their medicines, uh, you keep them out of hospitals, and that that in the long run saves you money. There's been an, an incredibly well done randomized trial in the United States, interestingly a Canadian who, were, who now is at Harvard University, yes. convinced a huge insurance company to let him, in a sense, play scientist with their insurance plans. And what they did is they had randomly assigned some of those plans to give patients free drugs after they had had a heart, heart attack. Right. The other patients had to pay the usual co-payments, $5, $10, right. $20. And? Well, what they found was if you give the patients the drugs for free, yeah. surprise, surprise, the patients take their medicines more often <laughs> for longer periods of time, which in and of itself is a good thing because their health is probably going to be improved. But they also found that because those patients had better overall health outcomes, yes. they stayed out of hospitals more. It didn't save total dollars to the system, but they yeah. saved enough in other costs that it basically paid for the, the drugs in the first place. So it was, it was basically a, a net zero financial impact for the health system, but yet patient care was improved, outcomes were better off. And as I said before, if Canada was to do this, we would not only benefit from better patient adherence, lower burden on our hospitals, but we'd also benefit from the increased purchasing power, which this American study did not take into account. It, so you, you can save billions that way too. I, I wasn't going to talk about this because I, I devoted a whole show to it a couple of weeks ago, but I, 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 and I have other things I want to talk about, but I can't help but think about the cost of psychotropics. Is that part of your mix, your thoughts? I'm talking about psychiatric medications and so on, and the enormous rise in curve in the, in the last... 30 years of mental illness and enormous expenditures of, of pharmaceuticals. Yeah, and when we talk about improving the quality of pharmaceutical care in our system, yes. sometimes that means ma taking more medicines when appropriate. Sometimes it, it means, means less. Sometimes it means taking less. Or, or uh, not. And, yeah. and, and in some uh, cases with certain kinds of mental illness, we absolutely want patients to be managing their, their care appropriately yes. with medicines. And in some cases, it might be better to get people access to other services that aren't insured as well. So quality cognitive services, like quality counseling and psychiatric care that is not pharmaceutical, um, it would be nice also to bring that into the mix with our healthcare system. Um, I guess we choose one battle at a time right now. Yeah, we're yeah. focusing on trying okay. to get the medicines it's there. A, for us, it's a bit of a tangent. Yeah. What about your colleague, uh, uh, Michael Law, who... Uh, I believe works side yep. by side with works you. Works down the hall. Uh, yeah. Down the hall. And he's also part of, as you are, evidencenetwork.ca, which I think is a marvelous little website. I should have told people to put that up. I'm sorry I didn't. Evidencenetwork.ca is worth going to. Now, he is saying, why don't we have uh, uh, public employees uh, 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 moved into the public system? Why do they get a special deal? Yeah, well, I, I, they, they get a special deal because like anyone who's an employee, their yes. employer offers them extended health benefits. Yes. I think what Mike's uh, argument here is that Pharmacare, the government, runs yes. Pharmacare. They already administer a, a drug program. Yes. Why not actually have the government program also administer the benefits for public employees? At little or no deductibles, but basically run the show for those employees. It's public money being spent on this through, through private mechanisms, and it's right. probably not as efficient as it could be. Um, Among other things, as he points out in a recent Sun article, 
administrative costs because you're duplicating. You, you know, we, we have administrative costs to run one system and administrative costs to run the other. Why are we doing the two? And it's absolutely crazy in, yeah. in the sense that ultimately the government has to monitor everybody's prescription fills in British Columbia and, and arguably in any province. Yeah. So we do. Anyway. we do this already. And, and I've got to give the government credit. British yes. Columbia has the best information system for prescription use in the country. It's, Truly. Un, it's unbelievably uh, advanced. The PharmaNet system, which you, you probably don't even realize is going on, no, but when I you, know when you visit on. a, a yeah. pharmacy and they, they scan your care card, they can see what prescriptions you filled, regardless of what pharmacy you went to. Your hospital can see that when you're admitted to hospital, and in, now your physicians can see that in their offices. And that's a great information system. Do you happen to know but, if that has helped uh, reduce or eliminate, or probably not eliminate, but reduce people messing with multiple prescriptions? We do know that the, that the system is used to monitor and, in, and try to enforce uh, you know, appropriate utilization of yeah. medicines that are controlled substance. So it, it is, in a sense, the watchdog system. Yes. It's also a system that lets you know or lets your pharmacist know that if you're about to fill a prescription written by Dr. X yes. and Dr. Y had already had you fill another prescription, the combination of which is deadly, yes. the red lights go on, the pharmacist says, whoa, you can't, we can't fill this for you. And it, we know it's improved quality. Yeah, I will often have somebody say, well, you should take X or something. And then my first question is, is that counterindicated with the other things that I already take? Yeah, and increasingly uh, yeah. now, uh, yeah. physicians and pharmacists have that information available to them. And it, British Columbians should actually be talking to their doctors about saying, you know, are you using this? And, and if not, when are you going to use it? Because and in fact, you know what I found that's quite astounding, and I found this more than once, is that I will go to a pharmacy and they will say, by the way, do you have a few minutes? And I'll say, yeah, what is it? Would, would you like to review your whole schedule yeah. and and talk about these things oh, sure why not yeah I've reviewed it I already know but you have a different perspective sure I'll take 10 minutes I think that's great yeah and increasingly we'd also like to see that happen in our primary care centers so yes. I to be honest the dream vision if you want to talk about the you know healthcare system according to Steve Morgan yeah, yeah. I, I would get a, a vast majority of the pharmacists that are in British Columbia today I'd get them out of the pharmacy and I'd get them into the clinics, into the healthcare centers, working oh. alongside of doctors so that they can have that counseling opportunity with you at the time the prescription's being written. You know, as a team, the combination of a doctor and pharmacist is far more par powerful than, in, than practicing in isolation. Yeah, and I, and I would think one of the biggest advantages of that PharmaNet, aside from people, you know, scoff laws trying to cheat the system, is people who are in their 70s who, who simply forget or, 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 or can't remember that there's this and there's that, and the system it, it tells you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's talk about, about something kind of nasty political, and that is uh, therapeutic initiatives. Uh, where are we on, on all of that? We know that uh, in April, uh, the Liberal government cut support for this, uh, this sort of watchdog system. How does that play into, or what's the latest on that, and how does it play into your thoughts on, on getting all of this under one paid system? Yeah, it's a great question. It's actually a question for which I don't have answers. Okay. I, I work in collaboration with people at the Therapeutics Initiative. I've yes. done so for over a decade now. What's your, what's um, your sense? Are they, are they decimated, or do they feel like they've just been thrown out under the bus, or...? Uh, my sense is that they're experiencing a difficult time as a, as a function of, of what are uh, you know, currently quite litigious challenges around some potential breaches of privacy and data access that yes. I'm not sure directly involve them, but may have indirectly, and I think that that may have made uh, this particular era more challenging than it, than it let, normally Let's just been. explain to everybody what that is. It's a, it was a system out of the university where people were looking at pharmaceuticals and saying well we can do better with this one and this one isn't quite right or yeah so there's the therapeutics the, initiative uh, its core function dating back till to the, to the early 1990s it was to provide the government independent advice about the relative merits of, of new drugs right. versus old drugs was it and terribly expensive this no system? not a, this evaluation services that they provide the government was relatively inexpensive and it was independent independent that's important and, and critically important and I've written about this a number, yes. on a number of occasions done studies that sort of celebrate uh, in a sense uh, British Columbia success with the TI 
for American audiences, I was commissioned by an American organization to, to, to tell the story about the therapeutics initiative Yeah, uh, because it, it does do good things. And, and having truly independent advice close to your minister of health is important because you want to actually depoliticize some coverage decisions that are Absolutely. ultimately political. Unfortunately, when you say no to funding a new drug that might be too expensive or maybe not as good as the manufacturer claims, it's a political challenge because patients want that drug virtually no matter what the evidence or the cost. People, people have made a point of saying, people probably the NDP, I can't remember who exactly, but probably the NDP have made a point of saying that uh, the Liberals have received uh, uh, pretty good funding in, in their political campaigns from, from pharma, for some pharmaceutical interests. Uh, do you, will you, you don't have to comment on that, but, but will you and your, your friend uh, Law and others and the Therapeutics Initiative people, will you start to get the ear, do you think, of, of the new health minister? I think we will. I think right now, because there there have been some uh, there's been some firings in the ministry. There yes. was some, there's some accusations oh, yeah. that are quite serious about some yeah. of the university-based research, not at all associated with our school and our center at UBC. But nevertheless, there's a cloud right now, and it's been in existence for about uh, 14 months or more uh, that makes it a little bit more difficult to get the ear of the government. That said, uh, I know my colleague Mike Law, for instance, has had opportunity to, to meet with government officials right up to the minister to talk about the stuff that we are experts in, which is how do you price and, and, and subsidize medicines. I expect, uh, you know, in the fall, that, honestly, that I will be able to have a chance to meet uh, both with the ministry staff within the, the pharmaceutical services yep. division, but also all the way up to the minister. For British Columbians, I think one of the important conversations will also have to happen with the Minister of Finance. Oh, yes. Pharmacare ultimately is a question of how do you raise the money? Exactly. Do you do it through the unions and employers that currently pay for it, or yes. do you do it through government? And let's say the world, we just have a minute left, let's say the world, according to Steve Morgan, came to pass, it would be a, a new chapter of the Bible, uh, uh, would I, as a consumer, be paying more, for, I, I don't remember, what What do I pay, $67 or something a month, whatever it is, it's, it's pretty Oh, reasonable. your MSP premium. Yeah, yeah. Will my premium skyrocket or at least go up? Uh, I think your the total tax bill will go yeah. up, but the total okay. cost to, to the average British Columbian will actually go down quite significantly. So you'll pay really? a little bit more in taxes, you'll pay a lot less out of pocket and a lot less through union dues and through your employer contributions. Fair enough. Thanks, Doc. Thank you. Good stuff. This is Steve Morgan, our guest. All right, folks, that's it for this week. Uh, next week, ah, the studio is dark next week, so we're running a repeat of uh, a show that got a lot of attention. Brian Fitzpatrick's son was killed in a dreadful, uh, unsafe work atmosphere, uh, crushed by a rock, and it's a whole gruesome story. Uh, but it has to do with a company that does a lot of business here, and has a dreadful uh, track record. That's coming up next week. Uh, DavidBurn.com is a site to visit. We thank you for being here again on Shaw Community Television Cable 4. Have a great night.